Hi and welcome back to another video. We are back in my production hall where we have big plans for 2022. One of these plans is to have some custom water cooling stuff available, mainly prototype stuff, mainly just one out of one products. But for these, the goal is that we walk in in the morning and we, for example, have a graphics card or like a main board. And I want to do, for example, a custom water cooling block for the GPU or for the main board. And we want to walk out in the evening with the block being ready. And that is a huge challenge to do that in time. And one of the most crucial parts about this is having a basic file to work on the water block. This could be achieved in different multiple ways. For example, you could work together with a manufacturer like NVIDIA and ask them for CAD files. That could work, but I want to be as independent as it could be to be completely free in the kind of products I want to do. And in that regard, we can only do 3D scanning or there is something, I think it would be translated in like needle scanner. It's like a big device where you have a needle that is going down on, I don't know, 100,000 points on the GPU, but that takes like a day or two days to scan, which is way too much time. We don't have the time to do that. That's why we decided to go for a 3D scanner. Back then, like 10, 15 years ago, it was quite a challenge to scan a surface of like a mainboard or a GPU with a 3D scanner. Simply because you have different surfaces and different characteristics, different materials, and they reflect the light to a different rate. Which results in that if you, for example, scanned a GPU, or like let's say you scanned the entire graphics card, then it could be that the GPU was just missing because of the different reflection characteristic of the GPU and the metals then it just wouldn't work out. But nowadays, if you get a very good scanner, then this is not an issue anymore. I will show you how this thing works in a second. This is a 3D scanning unit we are using. It's not that spectacular. It just has these like optical lenses on front. It's a handheld device, which will be pointed for our example to this 1050 Ti it should be. And it's laying on this surface, which you can rotate. It has some sort of structure to it for the better orientation of the 3D scanner software. The scanner also has a calibrated temperature, which means that it's now heating up internally. That's why there's a fan on top. It's not only for cooling purposes, but also because the device has to be heated to a certain temperature, otherwise it would not be as accurate. The scanning process itself is quite simple. It's just a handheld device. So you're just pointing it towards the PCB. And in case you're wondering why it's like flickering, it's because the internal light of the scanner is what you will see on the camera right now. But you will just have to move it along and across the entire surface, move it to every single direction, and then you would have the finished um, scan inside your software. And at this point, the software is reworking all the data it has collected, all the different images. Uh, we have about 600 to 700 images to form our 3D model for our tiny GPU. But if you would take, for example, a bigger main board or like a bigger GPU, we also scanned, for example, a PS5 already, which had about 16 gigabyte of raw data. And if you're computing this, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to compute on a notebook like this, which is a 10th gen mobile CPU, so it's not that slow. But yeah, oh, that looks quite nice. So our scan is almost ready to go. It's only missing one or two more steps and then we can get the final 3D file. And there it is, our final 3D model. Obviously nothing is adjusted in this scan. Otherwise we would remove the entire background, like everything that is underneath here, we would usually define as something that we won't like to see. Otherwise we would only see the GPU itself. That was only a raw scan, took us not even 10 minutes. And if you would do a bit more work on this scan, then it would be even better. And the accuracy of this is about 0.05 millimeters. So that is really great. And yeah, this would be perfect for us to work on water cooling gear, for example. The scanning process itself already takes up a lot of resources, but the thing is it's generating like a point cloud. And in the end, you want to close this point cloud into a 3D CAD file. And this process currently, we first tested this with a 9900K and it took about 15 minutes. Then we upgraded to a 5900X and it took about 10 minutes, but it was still loading all of the cores. That's why we decided to go for a Threadripper Pro system. And this will be our workstation for CAD, CAM, and also for the 3D scanning. That's what we're going to build today. The board we're using today for the build is the ASUS Pro WS WRX80 Sage. Very good mainboard name, thanks ASUS. 
And I'm um, just looking at the board, you can already see that originally Asus and maybe also AMD had different plans for this platform because originally Threadripper Pro was meant to be overclockable, but it's not. That's why I strongly dislike this platform just because they did a very stupid move in this regard. It's still a very good platform performance wise, but yeah, it's just sad that it's not overclockable anymore. The CPU we're using is the 3975WX. You may ask why we're not using the 64 core CPU, the 3990, but the reason for that is we simply don't know how many threads the software can utilize. We, s we still saw an improvement from going from 16 to 24 threads, but I hardly believe that the software could handle 128 threads and the CPUs and the board is already expensive enough. Like the CPU is close to 3000 euro and the board is like 1200. So the, just the base entrance cost of the system is already just way too high. Let's not drop the CPU into the socket. The memory kit is not that special. I mean, those are just ugly QVL list memory sticks, 3200 CL20, I think. But it's 128 gigabyte in total. In theory, the 30 Pro platform can support up to two terabyte of memory, which is half of the size of the normal Epic CPUs, but it's still quite impressive. It's also four times more than a desktop Threadripper but we won't need that much memory, like 128 gigabyte, which is what we're going to use in this system with Okta channel, should be sufficient. Some of those data files from the 3D scanner, they come out with like, I don't know, 15 gigabyte of size and they will be stored inside the memory. That's why I guess 128 gigabyte will be fine for the start. We will still have run, uh, other tools running in the background. That's why just to be safe, 128 gigabytes you can always upgrade later. One thing I learned over the years with Threadripper and also Epic is that you have to like test this before you assemble the system or assemble your server. There's always something going on with memory detection. At least that's what I learned from the Epic system we did back then, the, the Epic server. We had so many issues with memory detection that from my experience, it's just a lot better that when you have it assembled first, inserted all your memory dims, then just, just do a first boot and check if all the dims are detected or not. So first boot. The first look, uh, I think it's really good because usually if you have like strong memory issues, then this is always stuck at some C code for Threadripper and Epic. Don't be stuck at C2. Okay. Also not C8, please. Thank you. That's the point where the VGA would be detected. We don't use any at the moment, so that should be okay. We will mount the board inside a Lian Li Odyssey X aluminum case. You could argue that I'm a bit biased towards Lian Li in this case. Which is certainly true to some regard, but... I mean, it's a great case. It has good opportunities for cooling, which is absolutely necessary for the CPU and also the board. I mean, it's SSI EEB way too large for most of the cases and we also will need some additional devices like GPUs and uh, PCI Express SSDs and everything that will follow later so great case for this room. For SSI EEB at least for the ASUS board I'm not sure if that is standard or not but we will have to remove that one on top. The others stay but for ATX this would remain but for SSI EEB at least for our board this has to go and we have to add three like extended extender things on the right. We will start with a two terabyte Vesa Digital Blue SSD. It's nothing special, nothing that quick. Should be sufficient though for just running the operating system. There's also this card included, which we will later use. And there will also be two U.2 SSDs, which is also one reason why we decided to go for this board. The U.2 SSDs are not here yet. That's why we will have to finish the build anyway later at a certain point, but we'll see how far we can get today. You might have already noticed during our test assembly that we're using a Seasonic PSU GX 1300. 1300 watt is maybe a bit much. I guess a thousand watt would also work, but you will notice that if you just 
check out how many power connectors are required for this system is already quite insane. We have the 24 pin, then we have a dual EPS 8 pin, then we have a PCI Express 8 pin, and on the bottom there are additional two 6 pin PCI connectors. Depending on how many devices you're running of the seven PCI Express slots, then you might have to use those additional two pins or not. But we're also using a Quattro RTX 4000. It's not the strongest Quattro card available. It's also not the most, like, not the latest. But for what we're doing, like for our CAD, this is more than sufficient and this is already expensive enough. Even though this is just, in the end, an RTX 2080 Super, it's using a TU-104 GPU, yeah. but for what we're doing CA device should be absolutely enough. Even though we made very good progress so far, it is Saturday 8 p.m. right now and we still have to finish like video editing and everything for the video tomorrow. So we won't manage to finish the machine in time, which is still fine, because I also wanted to ask the cooling solution. My original plan was to have this H150i in there. But then I also know deep down in my heart that it's not covering the entire Threadripper, even though technically it's probably not going to make much difference cooling wise, but we could also switch to a different cooling solution now that we have time anyway. So if you have any kind of suggestions, feel free to let us know in the comments. What I also wanted to point out that we're using the Odyssey X in the dynamic version. You could also use the dynamic rotate, which is basically flipping the interior for the mounting, like everything internally will be flipped. Then you could also go for the performance version, which would allow to mount a 420 radiator. In this configuration, only three, like only 360 would work. But for me, this is visually the most appealing. That's why I'm going for the dynamic version, but just so you know, because this case would be available in three different styles, you could mount it. That's what's making this case so special. Still, it's just awesome to have full aluminum cases because no weight, very nice, All right? I still hope you enjoyed this video, especially maybe the 3D scanning part. Thanks for tuning in, see you next time. Bye-bye.